There is no substitute for the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Each weekday on Enjoying the Journey, Scott Pauley leads us in a brief study of Scripture. Today, on the Weekend Pulpit, we are happy to share a full-length Bible message given through Scott's pulpit ministry. These messages were recorded live in a local church or gospel event in recent days. It is our prayer that the message will be a help to you today. Tonight we are going to take a journey, a trip. We're going to go halfway around the world to a place, a part of the world that I love, to Israel. Today I spoke with our friends who are helping us coordinate all of our Bible study tours to the Holy Land. We have one, God willing, coming up at the end of this year. And they were telling me that things look very positive there on that end to be able to start having tours again, and I hope and pray God will let us go back. How many of you have ever been to the Holy Land? Yeah, I'd strongly recommend it to you. And uh, I'm telling you, there's nothing quite like standing there where Jesus stood and studying the Bible and the land of the Bible. It'll do your heart good. But if you never make it to Jerusalem on this side, we'll all gather in the new Jerusalem someday, right? Uh, but I, I love that part of the world. But we're not just going to take a geographical trip. We're going to have to go back in time several thousand years, and we're going to stop at the same place we've been studying all week long at different periods in history. And I'm doing this for a reason. This is the last meeting that I have to preach to you, the last opportunity, and frankly, my heart is burdened tonight. I'm burdened for you. I'm burdened for our country. I'm burdened for the work of God. I'm burdened because I see so many people who once were so strong for the Lord, who seem to be wavering at this moment. So many great churches. You have a great church. This is a great church. The church is represented here tonight from this area. Wonderful churches. But I just want you to know something. Just because your church has had a great past doesn't mean it's going to have a great future. What I'm bringing tonight is a closing warning Frankly, I like the promises of the Bible better than the warnings of the Bible, but God gives us the positive and the negative because we need both of them. And so with that in mind, I want you to open your Bible with me in the Old Testament tonight to the book of 1 Kings chapter number 12. Now, you'll have to keep your Bible near you because we're going to just take a little trip, so get your, get your fingers limbered up, and you may want to have a pen and something to write on so you can write the references down as we go. You can go back through them a little later like almost a, a chain reference. But they all have one thing in common. They all have a place in common. Anybody like to guess what the place is? What, what would you think? It's a smart church, I'm telling you. Bethel. In every meeting, we have studied what God did in Bethel. And I didn't come up with this. This is one of the Lord's emphases in Scripture. See, when God repeats something in the Bible, that ought to get your attention because God never repeats himself accidentally or incidentally or coincidentally. When God repeats himself, it's always on purpose. It's not about the place. It's about the principle. Bethel, the name Bethel, means house of God. We understand as New Testament Christians that we don't have to go to a tent or a tabernacle somewhere or even to a church building to meet with God. When you know Jesus, he comes to live inside of you and your heart becomes the house of God. That's a glorious thought, isn't it? Even when we get to heaven someday. In the Revelation, the Bible says there's no temple there. Why is there no temple? Because the Lamb will be the temple of that place. It is never about the place. It is always about the person. May I just say, it's not about this church. It's about the God of this church. It's not about a preacher. It's about the God that preacher is preaching. Now, we, uh, we know that Bethel was a famous and familiar place. 
It was a high and a holy place built on high ground, about 2,200 feet above sea level, which is way up in the land of Israel, overlooking all of that holy land. And it was built at a very strategic place of the crossroads of that country with a thoroughfare that went north to south and east to west so that everybody had to come through the house of God. I love that. Everybody had to travel past the altar. And again and again, God brought his people to that place of prayer. It may not look like much to you. It was just kind of a stony, barren kind of land. But the Lord makes everywhere beautiful when he shows up. And so it was a beautiful and a blessed place because God was in that place. You don't believe me? Ask Abram. Abram, you ever been to Bethel? Have I been to Bethel? I met God in Bethel. And after I went down to Egypt and messed things up royal, I went back to Bethel. And when I got back to Bethel, I found that the God of Bethel was right where he had always been. Hey, Jacob, I know your granddaddy visited Bethel, but did you ever go to Bethel? Did I go to Bethel? Two of the greatest days of my life happened in Bethel. It was in Bethel where God really changed my life and changed my nature and changed my name because in Bethel, I saw God. I came into constant contact with the creator God of heaven. And I'm not Jacob anymore. I'm Israel. I'm prince with God because I met God at Bethel. Ask the whole nation of Israel. Is Bethel significant for any reason? Is it significant? Oh, yes, when we needed to pray, we went to the altar at Bethel, Judges chapter 20. We studied it last night when they had a decision to make and enemies staring them in the face and lots of difficulty. What did they do? They went to the place where God's house was and they sought the Lord. Bethel was a place of prayer, always symbolized by the altar. Tonight, I have one question. Whatever happened to Bethel? It's mentioned 60 times in the Old Testament. It is not mentioned a single time in the New Testament. It is connected to 30 different Bible stories and prophecies in the Old Testament. And it is connected to nothing in the New Testament. If I were to take you to Bethel now, you can go there now. You can find it even online and look at pictures of it. Now, there are things that have been built up near it now, but the ancient city of Bethel and its towns sits in ruins. It's just ruins. That's all it is. You can go there and take pictures of the ruins, but that's all you're going to see. Whatever happened to Bethel? We begin our journey in 1 Kings chapter number 12. Look at verse number 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. Jeroboam was a fleshly man, king of Israel, concerned about what was going to happen. His people were going to depart and follow after Rehoboam and Judah. And so what does he do? Look at verse 28. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Time out just a minute. This came out of his heart, not God's heart. This came from man's counsel, not God's wisdom. He makes two golden calves. Does that sound familiar to any Bible students in this room tonight? You remember Aaron? Funny how sins repeat themselves, isn't it? Some of you right now, you're stuck in some sin. You're captured by it. You're in bondage to it. You just keep repeating it over and over and over and over again, almost to the point where you think, well, that's just the way I am. That's just the way I was made, and I'm never going to get any victory over it. Maybe it's not as bad as somebody else or not as bad as it used to be, but you've learned to live with it, and you've learned to excuse it, and I want you to know God wants you to be free of it. Interesting how sin continues. And it gets worse. He doesn't make one golden calf. He makes two golden calves. What does he say? Same thing Aaron said. Here's your gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Excuse me. That's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard in my life. You're telling me you made a cow out of gold, and that's the God that brought you and delivered you out of the land of Egypt? You've lost your ever-living mind. You know what sin is? It's stupid. 
And it gets dumber and dumber all the time. How many of you have noticed, it seems like the whole world's lost its mind lately. Anybody else notice that? You know why common sense has been lost? Hear me very carefully. Because when you reject light, you get darkness. And when you say no to truth, you start believing lies. There is a miserable insanity to sin. Why do you think the prodigal had to come to himself? Doesn't make sense. Doesn't have to make sense. Because sin at its core is a lie. Keep reading. What does he do with them? Verse number 29. And he set the one... In where, please? Can you imagine? Look, close your eyes just a minute. Use a little sanctified imagination. I want you to picture for just a minute the altar that Abraham and Jacob built there. And right next to it, a golden cow. Look at me just a minute. I want you to imagine the contrast between meeting God and playing at religion. In Bethel of all places, in the house of God, in the place of the altar, in the place of prayer, there's a golden calf. What a mockery of a holy God. Come down to verse number 32. Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the 15th day of the month, like to the feast that's in Judah. And he offered upon the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the 15th day of the 8th month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart. Dear God, deliver us from our own heart. I hear people today say, trust your heart. You better not. It'll take you to hell. You better trust Jesus. Somebody said, well, if I know my own heart, you don't. Because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, try the heart, God says. You better be very careful when you start leaning to your own understanding. Did you know it's possible to have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof, to have the place of Bethel but not the God of Bethel? Did you know you can have an altar, you can go through the motions of prayer, you can even use religious language, but you can miss the dynamic power of Almighty God? Whatever happened to Bethel? Bethel had so much light. I wish I had time to take you to all the places where Bethel is mentioned in Scripture. I've done that myself in recent days just because I wanted to acquaint myself with it. And I was shocked. I mean, I've read it before, but I was shocked when I started connecting all the dots. Do you remember when God used Deborah, the, the judge, to judge Israel? Remember Deborah, who was mightily used of God? Do you know where Deborah judged Israel from? She judged Israel from Bethel. Did you know that Samuel the prophet preached in Bethel? People say sometimes, now if we could get that preacher, if we could get that preacher, you listen to me carefully, it doesn't matter who shows up if God's not there. Samuel the prophet preached in Bethel. How many of you would hang around till midnight tonight if you knew old Samuel the prophet was going to be here to preach a sermon? How many of you would stick around? Sure, we'd fight for the front seats too. We'd want to get down near the front, hear that old man of God. Forget the man of God. What about the God of that man? Did you know Elijah went through Bethel on his way to heaven? Elijah and Elisha are walking along. Remember that? And Elijah says to Elisha, I'm going up today. I'm, I'm going to leave you today. And Elisha says, well, then I'm not leaving you. I'm staying with you till you go. You read their, read their story, read the narrative, and chart their course. Guess where they walked through? Watch this. On his way to heaven, Elijah walked through Bethel. That's powerful. I imagine Elijah knowing he's getting ready to go meet God, walking through Bethel and thinking about Abraham meeting with God there the first time and Jacob meeting with God there the first time. I'm telling you, this is holy ground because God is there. But don't you miss this. That kind of light, that kind of truth, that kind of opportunity makes a man, makes a nation, makes a family, makes a church that much more accountable to Almighty God. To whomsoever much is given... Much is required. Whatever happened to Bethel? Turn a page in your Bible. Look at chapter 13. 
one of the old preachers comes. A prophet, a man of God. We don't know his name. God knows his name. Look at verse number four. It came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried, mark it please, against the altar in Bethel. You know why he's preaching against the altar? Because it wasn't God's altar. It was the altar to the false gods. He put forth his hand from the altar saying, lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again to him. And look at verse number five. The altar also was rent. And the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. Can you imagine a place that had the man of God and the message of God and the miracle power of God, but they rejected the God? Imagine standing in Bethel that day. It doesn't say the man of God tore down the altar. It says God rent the altar. It just, boom, fell apart. All the ashes fell out. Imagine standing there that day and looking the old preacher in the face and saying, we don't want your preaching around here. That's exactly what they did. Let's take our journey. You ready? Stay with me now. Go over a few pages to 2 Kings chapter 10. You've been in 1 Kings. Look at 2 Kings. Pops up again. Look at 2 Kings chapter number 10 in your Bible and verse number 29. It wasn't just Jeroboam. No, no, no. You mamas and daddies, listen to me just a minute. What you allow in your home, you're allowing into the hearts of your children. Everybody look at me just a minute. What you let in a church doesn't just affect the church now. It affects the direction of that church to the generation to come. You're not just choosing for you. Look at 2 Kings 10, verse 29. How be it? From the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu, another man, another king, departed not from after them. To wit, would you mark this? The golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. What happened? They kept the same old stinking idols. Come on now, we're taking another step. Come over to 2 Chronicles with me, would you please? I'll tell you what, let's stop in 2 Kings 17 on our way. One more stop. Just look at chapter 17. They got carried away captive. They get to come back. Look at 2 Kings 17, verse 27. The king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom you brought from thence, and let them go dwell there. Let him teach them the manner of the God of the land. Every time I read that, I think, that's amazing. I mean, look, the king's heart really is in the hand of the Lord. A pagan king said... Why don't you send one of their old priests, one of their old spiritual leaders, and let him teach them how to fear their God again? It's pretty bad when lost people know God's people ought to fear God more than God's people know they ought to fear God. We talk about the fear of God being lost in our world. Long before the fear of God gets lost in the world, the fear of God gets lost in the church. Look at verse 28. And one of the priests whom they carried away from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel, I love this, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. May I just stop and say, we need a good steady dose of the fear of God again. Where is the fear of God in our day? Romans 1 says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. Look at verse number 29, how be it? Every nation made gods of their own. And put them in the houses of the high places which the Samaritans had made. He's preaching in Bethel. He's teaching in Bethel. He's telling them in Bethel, you better fear God again. Look at verse 32. So they feared the Lord and made into themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the house of the high places. And here's one of the craziest things I've ever read. Look at verse number 33. They feared the Lord and served their own gods. You know what's really interesting? You just read our newspaper right there. Ask the average person in our land, do you, do you believe there's a God? Oh, yeah, I believe there's a God. There's a higher power. Do you fear God? Oh, yeah, I fear God. And then they live like the devil. i tell you our problem. I'm talking about God's people right now. We f- say we fear the Lord. We say we fear the Lord. And then we do what we well pleased to do, not what is well pleasing to him. In Bethel. Now go with me to 2 Chronicles just a minute. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 13. It ends in tragedy. 2 Chronicles chapter 13. Look at verse 
Number 18, thus the children of Israel were brought under at that time, the children of Judah prevailed because they relied upon the Lord God of their fathers. And Abijah pursued after Jeroboam and took cities from him. And notice what God calls by name. He didn't just say that the nation fell. He didn't just say cities plural fell. Look who's first on the list. Bethel with the towns thereof. I tremble as I stand before you tonight because I think of how much truth I've been exposed to. Now you hear me just a minute. We live in one of the most glorious parts of the world and and a rich, rich heritage of Bible teaching and gospel truth. But I'm going to tell you something. That ought to make us fear before Almighty God. That means we are that much more accountable to our great God. Do you understand what this church is going to have to answer to God for someday? Do you understand what people who've grown up around this and heard about God all their life are going to meet someday when they kneel at the nail-pierced feet of Jesus Christ? I say to you, Bethel is most accountable because Bethel knew God. Whatever happened to Bethel? There was one little glimmer in 2 Kings or one of God's good men named Josiah brought a little reform in Bethel and tore down some of the altars, but it never recovered its splendor. It never recovered its former glory. It never went back to the days of blessing. They never again worshiped God and knew the power of God in Bethel like they did in the former days because they let something in that took the place only God should have. And I wonder, what is it in your life? What's your golden cat? What's the thing you've allowed to take the place only Jesus ought to have in your heart? What's the place in your family that only the Lord is worthy of, but you've let other things slip in, and after a while, you don't want to hear the preaching anymore. We don't like this kind of preaching anymore. It's old-fashioned. It's out of tune. It's out of date. It's it's not culturally relevant and politically correct. Listen to me, please. This is an hour for God's people to wake up and say, we must get back to the God of Bethel again. And that means anything that stands in the way of God must have to go. Whatever happened to Bethel? Come with me. We're on our journey. Come with me to the book of Amos. We move from the historical books to the prophetical books. Amos was a farmer, a herdman from Tekoa. He was a country boy. He was a man greatly used of the Lord. It's amazing how many references to Bethel are found in Amos' preaching. Look at Amos chapter 3 and verse number 14. God says that in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel. And the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. I wonder sometimes if Jesus passed through most of our towns, if he wouldn't just look at the church buildings and say, that one can fall. Who cares about the architecture? Who cares how nice the facility is if God's not there? Look at chapter 4, verse number 4. Come to Bethel and what? Does that look odd to you? Look at, look at Amos 4, verse 4. Look at it. Come to Bethel and what? Tr- Does your Bible say transgress? How many of you your Bible says transgress? Wait a minute. I'm thinking, come to Bethel and worship. Come to Bethel and pray. Come to Bethel and praise. Come to Bethel and commune with God. Come to Bethel and meet with the Lord. No, no. Come to Bethel and sin. Look across the page at chapter 5. God says, verse number 5, but seek not Bethel. He said, you won't find what you need at Bethel anymore. Nor enter into Gilgal and pass not to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to what? I'm going to tell you something. God brings everything that is separate from his presence to nothing. You know what I've discovered? Every sermon without God is not. Every prayer without God is not. Every song without God is not. Every meeting without God is not. Every day without God is not. Every project without God is not. Everything in my life is nothing if God is not in the middle of it. Look at verse number 6. Seek the Lord. Come over to chapter 7. 
He mentions it again. Look at Amos 7, verse number 12. Let's start in verse 11. For thus Amos saith, that's the preacher, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. Israel shall surely be led away, captive out of their own land. By the way, he spoke the truth. He said it right, but they had itching ears. They didn't want that kind of preaching. So look at verse number 12. Amaziah said to Amos, O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. Look, please. He literally said to the preacher, stop preaching that stuff here. Why don't you go somewhere else and preach that? We don't want your preaching here. You ever wonder why people don't want to come to church anymore? You ever wonder why there's only a certain kind of preaching people who want to hear? All this, excuse me, motivational nonsense that makes the world a better place from which to go to hell and gives you a little warm, fuzzy feeling and a moment of inspiration and a glimmer of goodness so you can get through another day but doesn't help you know God, that is not the truth of the Bible. Somebody's got to stand up and say, you must seek God again. Churches aren't supposed to be entertainment centers. That's not what we're here for. We're not here to put on a good show. I'm not here to entertain you tonight. You don't have to remember my name. You don't have to like it. You don't have to enjoy it. I'm not a comedian. I'm not a dramatist. I'm a preacher of the word of God. And let Amaziah say all he wants to. We don't want your preaching. Amos must still stand up and say, the God of Bethel, the God of the Bible, is the true and living God, and he must be known. Look at verse number 13. They said, but prophesy not again anymore at Bethel. That's about enough preaching at Bethel. That's about enough praying at Bethel. That's about enough talk about God around here. Whatever happened to Bethel? You're in the prophets, right? Go back just a few pages to the book of Hosea. You're close. Look at Hosea chapter number 4. This blew me away when I saw it this week. By the way, we're almost done with our trip, so stay with me till the landing, please. Look at Hosea chapter 4, verse 15. Though thou, Israel, play the harlot, yet let not Judah offend, and come not ye unto Gilgal. Neither go ye up to, what's that name, church? Would you say it out loud? Beth Avon. Would you circle that in your Bible? nor swear the Lord liveth. Did you know that this is Bethel? And God renamed it. Do you remember in our study, we, we started by recognizing that Bethel originally was called Luz. Everybody remember that? L-U-Z, it was Luz at the first. And then it became Bethel, the house of God. And then when Jacob really got taken with the God of that place, he renamed Bethel into El Bethel. So it wasn't the house of God. Now it was the God of the house of God. But now it gets renamed by God. And God calls it beth Aven. Same geographical location coupled together with Gilgal like Bethel always was. Would you like to know what Beth Avon means? Hold on to your seat. Beth Avon means house of idols. Wait a minute. What did Bethel mean, church? Anybody remember? What did Bethel mean? House of God, capital G, the one true and living God. But by the time it's over, the house of God has become house of idols. Look at the deterioration of sin. Look at the decay of sin. Listen to me. Sin never gets better on its own. You, you follow the way of the flesh and the, and the way of all things, and it always goes downhill when it moves away from the presence of God, Almighty God. Look at verse number 16. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. You ever hear the term backslider? We say sometimes people have been saved, but they're backslidden, come straight from the Bible. See, everybody in this room is moving one of two directions right now. You're either moving forward or you're moving backward. There is no such thing as stationary in the Christian faith. You're either growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus and pursuing, becoming what God wants you to be, or you're moving away from God in the other direction. You're either running toward the presence of God or like Adam and Eve on the day of their transgression or Cain when he killed his own brother, you're going out from the presence of the Lord. Which way are you moving right now? I think verse 17 is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. Ephraim has joined idols. Let him alone. 
You want to know the worst day of a person's life? It's the worst day of a person's life right here when God just lets them have what they want. And says, all right, you wanted it. I tried to stop you. I tried to warn you. I'm going to give you your way. You want your way or God's way? Whatever happened to Bethel? Whatever happened to it? One more verse. Go to the book of Ezra. It might seem like we're going backwards, but we're not. Because chronologically, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther would go at the end of the Old Testament. They would match the last three prophetical books. And if you go to Ezra chapter 2, this is the last mention chronologically of Bethel. It's after the carrying away into captivity. They're returning now. They're coming back. Remember, coming back to rebuild. And sandwiched right in this list. Look at Ezra 2, verse number 28. The men of where, church? The men of Bethel and Ai. And this is just, whew, my soul. How did we get here? 220 and 3. Do you understand how great Bethel had been? Do you understand how prominent? Look, this, this town, this city was, was mentioned second only to Jerusalem in number of times. Do you understand in the thinking of the people how big Bethel was in every way? And now God says, if you take all the men of Bethel and Ai together, you got 200 and some. The last mention of the house of God it is a tiny little village with a few people. I want you to write a statement down tonight. Here's the whole message in one point. Would you write it down? When the presence of God is gone, nothing is left but ruins. You can dress it up, clean it up, and talk it up. But if you look behind the facade, when the presence of God is gone, nothing is left but ruins. You know what I fear? I fear that our nation is at this moment barreling like a speeding train towards ruin. I think there are churches that don't even recognize that they're headed towards ruin. There are families and little children and little, little, little ones being raised in homes headed towards ruin. There are preachers headed towards ruin and lives headed towards ruin. It doesn't have to be that way. They're headed towards ruin because they're moving away from the presence of God. Someone said, the saddest words of tongue or pen are these for it might have been. I disagree. I think the saddest four words are, it used to be. It used to be. Whatever happened to Bethel? Whatever happened to that church? Man, I used to hear about that church. They would win people to Jesus and God was in that place. Whatever happened to that church? Oh, it's about closed now. Whatever happened to that family? They used to sit, you know, they sat back in that section. You know that family, whatever. Those were nice people. Well, they were great people. Whatever happened to that family? Well, they started making some allowances, you know, and they let a few things in with their children before long. They started missing church, and then, then they were out all together. Whatever happened to that young man? He had such promise. What potential? Whatever happened to him? Oh, he wrecked his life. He sinned against God. Whatever happened to that preacher? 
Boy, he was a preacher now. Yeah, he's not in the ministry now. He brought reproach to the name of Jesus. Whatever happened to Bethel? I was preaching in Ohio a few months ago. I was preaching with an old evangelist. He's still preaching. Been at it, I think, for 70 years. He's quite a man. I said to him, Brother Clayton, talk to me more about your, your heritage. Talk to me more about, about how you came up. And he said, oh, I can still see him. Big old barrel chest. He said, oh, he said. Dallas Billington, he was the preacher. He said, quite a preacher he was. He said he pastored the Akron Baptist Temple. And he said the Akron Baptist Temple was quite a place. I said, how big was the Akron Baptist Temple? He said, oh, they ran five or 6,000. I said, five or 6,000? He said, oh, yeah. He said, you couldn't get in the place. And he said, people came from everywhere to hear the gospel. He said, Scott, it was the most amazing church. He said, they were, they were burdened for sinners and wept for souls. He said, people in that church were just eaten up with getting people to Jesus. And he said, that's how I came up. And he said, it got in me. I said, that's wonderful. I said, what happened to the Akron Baptist Temple? He said, it's gone. I said, you mean it's not like it used to be? He said, no, I mean it's gone. I said, where was it? He said, well, let's go look at it. And we got in a car with his son, who was the pastor. And they drove me downtown to the old Akron Baptist Temple. It took up two or three city blocks. Huge. One of the biggest church buildings I've ever seen in my life. Buildings are falling in. We drove around. I'd never seen anything so big in my life. I mean, it was massive, massive. He said, this place used to be full of cars. He said, they'd line up buses here bringing people to Jesus. Parking lots broken up. Trees growing up through the cement. Moss and grass growing over the building. We pulled up next to one of the curbs and got out. I could see the hurt, the grief of that old fellow. We walked over, looked inside a window, and oh, it was awful. Homeless people had been living inside, drug paraphernalia everywhere. Awful. Whatever happened to the Akron Baptist Temple? It's gone now. It's gone. You understand that where you are now is not where you will be 10 years from now. You'll either be further along with the Lord or you're going to be gone too. I love your emphasis this year. I love this idea of heritage. But, but I want to say to you, don't let your heritage be just history. See, for some people, heritage is just, that's nostalgic. That's the good old days. It's how it used to be. The God of the Bible is not a past tense God. He's a present tense God. See, old people like to live in the past and young people like to live in the future. God wants to work in the present. He's not I was and he's not I will be. He's I am, which means that the God of the Bible, the God of Bethel, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Israel, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ is our God right now and he wants to work mightily in our lives. And let it never be said of this church. Let it never be said of your family. Let it never be said of your life or my life. Whatever happened to Bethel? If this Bible message has been used of God in your life, or we can pray for you in some definite way, please contact us at enjoyingthejourney.org. We hope you will share the message with others who may also be encouraged by it. For additional full-length Bible messages, please visit Dr. Scott Pauley's YouTube channel. Tomorrow is the Lord's Day. 
and we want to encourage you to be faithful to attend a Bible preaching church in your area this Sunday. Thank you for listening to The Weekend Pulpit. And don't miss Enjoying the Journey Daily Devotional Podcast each Monday through Friday.